You started, Bob, as a college football guy, is that? Well, when I came out of the Marine Corps after World War II, I went back to school on the GI Bill of Rights at Tulsa University. And they had a, they were one of three or four radio, uh, colleges in the whole country that had a radio station. Uh -huh. So they had a broadcast journalism course, which I took. And then I got a job doing uh, the Muskogee Reds in the Class C Western Association. I'd drive, I'd go to school and then drive 60 miles over to a game and then drive back. But that was my first baseball job. Wow. And uh, are we are we on now? Yeah. We're oh, doing, okay. Oh, yeah. But that's perfect. That's exactly what I want. Just conversational. You know. I mean, it's not about anything special. But that, so, then how long were you working in minor leagues? And where did you go? Well, let's see. I spent one year at Muskogee in the Class C Western Association, and then a job opened with opened up with the Tulsa Oilers of the Texas League. The league grill Hallett came from Chicago to run that ball club and. Uh, I became their broadcaster, and I stayed there only for about a year and a half. Then in 49, Mel Allen hired Kurt Gowdy to join him here in New York. So that left an opening in Oklahoma City, which was truly the best job in Oklahoma at that time. So I said yes, and I went to Oklahoma City. And I stayed there until 54, when Gowdy, who had moved on to Boston to do the Red Sox, invited me to join him in Boston always wondered what the connection was, right, because I know yeah. you and Kurt worked together. Yeah, we Kurt. worked together in Oklahoma, huh? on Oklahoma football, which was Bud Wilkinson's days. Terrific football. We also did a lot of basketball. Hank Ivan, Oklahoma a and in those days. Mm -hmm. And that was great bas basketball. You bet. You bet. And I knew that you guys had worked together, and I didn't, I'd never made the connection. I didn't realize you had followed Kurt at Oklahoma City in the baseball. That's, yeah, okay. So now you go to Boston, and then uh, you were there? Well, I, I was there for six years, and uh, Ernie Harwell was in Baltimore doing the Orioles, and Detroit hired Ernie Harwell to come to Detroit to take over that job, which created an opening in Baltimore, and the Orioles, leaving Fail was their general manager at that time, offered the job to me, and Gotti said to me, kid, you can't turn down a number one job, you've got to take it. So after six years in Boston, I went to Baltimore, and I was there two years when the opportunity came up to come to New York. Well, how did how did that come about? I mean, did somebody contact you from the Met? Well, that was the old audition process. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to think. Uh, there was a wonderful man who's no longer with us named Norm Barney. who had come out of Duke and been with the baseball program down there. He was in charge of the baseball operation for J. Walter Thompson. And J. Walter had the Rheingold account. And they auditioned people to put the broadcast team together. And in those days, Mrs. Payson would drive in and listen to the tapes, believe it or not. But uh, I was asked to send a tape in. I did. There were about, I don't know, I've been told there were 200. I have no idea what was in it. But anyhow, to make a long story short, I won the audition. When they put the team together, they wanted somebody with a national reputation. That was Lindsey Nelson's first football. He didn't have to go through the audition process. Ralph Kiner for his baseball prowess. They talked to people like Pee Wee Reese and Bobby Thompson, and Ralph had had one year of broadcasting with, with the White Sox of Chicago. So Ralph got the role of a former ball player, and they wanted somebody who had the experience of doing everyday Major League Baseball, and that's where I fit in. Terrific, and you guys worked together? Oh, about 17 years. Yeah, we came together and we were, in those days, the three of us did all the radio and all the television, so we, we, we really kept busy. Well, how, how, <coughs> excuse me. Well, how did you work that, Bob? I mean, did you do well, three we, innings? Well, Lindsay and I would alternate. One day, one day I'd open on radio, and the next day I'd open on TV and alternate with Lindsay. Ralph would work in the middle of the game, usually the fourth or fifth inning, and then he'd go downstairs after the game is over to the studio to do Kiner's Corner. Right, exactly, yeah. that's right. So if the game went long, if there was extra innings, Lindsay and I were on our own, and we'd, we'd pass each other in the hallway every three innings, switching back and forth from radio and TV. I'll never forget the uh, <laughs> wonderful 23 inning game we had here on a Sunday afternoon. We went on the air with that doubleheader at 1 o'clock. We went off the air that night at 11.30. And in the second game, as always, Ralph left in the eighth inning to go downstairs and do Kiner's Corner. So every now and then they'd punch up a shot of Ralph sitting down there smoking a cigar, relaxing, enjoying himself. Uh, Lizzie and I were working our fool heads off. 
I remember that. That's right. It was the Giants, in fact. Yeah, yeah. it was San Francisco yep. Giants. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, a guy who's in the Hall of Fame got it, cemented himself in the rotation that uh, long 23 inning game. I'm trying to, oh, Gaylord Perry. Yeah, oh, yeah. right. I yeah, remember. he pitched 10 scoreless innings in that game. That's right. Yeah, that was some. That was some day. That's Willie Mays right. wound up playing shortstop. Yeah, I was going to say Mays played the infield. I remember that. Yeah, that was some day. What's your uh, was your relationship with Casey Stengel in the early days? Oh, we all got along with Casey so well. Casey used to refer to Ralph and Lindsay and myself as my announcers. Mm -hmm. But we we decided we, the first day we went to spring training in '62. We said, well, now the main thing we've got to do is get acquainted with Casey. And, and see how, how, you know, learn from Casey what he wants to do here. Well, we started out that way. We'd go out with Casey after the game every night. But Casey just wore us out after about a week. We, we were trying to hide behind the potted palm trees in the hotel lobby to get away from him. Because he was so strong, he was just incredible. Yeah, yeah, he was, um, he'd, go, he'd, he'd go hours and hours, yeah. He'd keep you up till 2 or 3 in the morning and say, I'll see you at 6.30 for breakfast. Mm -hmm. well, and he, he meant it. Oh, yeah, he was there, sure. <laughs> That's very scary. What's your favorite Casey story? Oh, guys, there's been so many of them. Uh, Casey could remember amazing things. He couldn't remember. He wasn't too good on names, but he never forgot anything. Uh, Casey had started out in baseball in 1910 in Kankakee, Illinois. And one thing about Casey, every place the Mets would go, there'd always be, always be some old-timer down around the dugout who wanted to say hello to him. We're in Chicago one day, and this old-timer said he had to say hello to Casey because he used to own a restaurant, and Casey would come in there. So I said to Casey, there's a guy over there who says you used to come into his restaurant in Illinois. Casey said, I'll go talk to him. So Casey went over and started talking to him, and the guy said, you know, you used to come into my restaurant. He said, you didn't have a restaurant. You had a diner is what you had. He said, the ball players used to eat there for $5 a week, if you'll remember. And he says, furthermore, the league folded up in July in the middle of the week, and you still owe me $2.50. <laughs> Casey loved it to last story. Oh, yes, I bet he did. Yeah, he, he was really something. They, um, what was it like working in the polo grounds? Uh, you know, I mean, what were the facilities like there? Well, they weren't good at all, as you know, Bill, or probably know. We were only there two years, fortunately. Uh, you walked yourself silly getting from uh, the parking lot where you left your car to get to the broadcast booth. But you walked from, usually from the, the clubhouse was out in center field. So you'd walk from center field across the outfield grass and the infield, then come in and climb up the steps and go to your radio booth. Uh, but we enjoyed it. You know, after all, the thing is, it was the major leagues. And we were thrilled with just being here and being in the big leagues. And uh, w w in my case, my first ambition in broadcasting was to get to the major leagues. I accomplished that when I joined Kurt Gowdy in 54 in Boston. Then my next ambition was to get a chance to work in New York. So it, that fit perfectly for me. Yeah. And one thing I'm proud of, I now have the distinction or whatever of having done more ball, New York games on radio than anybody else ever has. Yep, I would think uh, by far. Yeah, so it's not even close. Yeah, I think by far. And you know what? That's still terrific. Well, you're kind. No, I'm serious. I don't know how you maintain your level of enthusiasm and the sense that you are having a good time that comes through to the listeners. Well, I, Billy, I feel like some days I do and some days I don't. Uh, I've reached an age now where I, I get tired a lot, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I try to take an hour nap before I come into the ballpark at night mm -hmm. and uh, just try to keep it together as best I can. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what, I mean, you do a terrific thing. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's not easy to do. See, people don't understand. Baseball is a seven-day-a-week business. And it's, uh, it's, it's a full-time business. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Shea Stadium opens in 1964. Right. And we're in a new environment here, and all of a sudden, like, the ticket sales double, and, you know, the Mets become a, a, a big thing. Thing. I mean, it, it, almost overnight. Was it the World's Fair? Or what'd you, what do you think it was? Well, it was Shea Stadium. was a new jewel of a ballpark. It may not look like it right now, but in 64, when the doors opened, it was a magnificent new stadium. And it was all right across the street, of course, the World's Fair was going on. So people would come to an afternoon game and stay and go across the street and go to the World's Fair after the game was over. 
So we were off to a terrific start. They didn't have a very good ball club, as you know, <laughs> and lost an awful lot of games. But, but Shea Stadium was a marvelous place to be. You know, to me, this ballpark, even though it's old and antiquated and out of date somewhat, to me, it's still a terrific place to watch a ball game. I love it when the place is full. Yep, yep I agree with that. I think the, the sight lines here are very good. They're, the angles for viewing are very good. And it has a nice homey feel about it. And they say we're going to have about 45,000 tonight, so it ought to be fun. But uh, I think when now you have new facilities and a new situation taking shape, I mean, and clearly now this is the major league thing that you had hoped it would be rather than being in the polo ground. Oh, it's been a major league operation all the way. The one place where the Mets have been so fortunate compared to other major league ball clubs around the country. I think to really be successful, you have to have terrific ownership. Well, Mrs. Payson was the first owner of the club for 20 years, and she was just loved by everybody. Everybody thought, what a terrific lady. She was exactly that, she was a terrific lady. And then when finally they had to sell the ball club, they had the good fortune of getting Nelson Doubleday and Fred, Fred Wilpon into the picture, and this ownership has been terrific. So the thing that's been consistent from day one till now has been good ownership. When you first started, I think we were on the radio on WABC? WABC, yeah, the first year. And uh, Howard Cosell was part of our picture. Right, that's what I was thinking, because I thought Howard was involved, and on, on Channel 9, there was a post-game show with... Um, Ralph Branca? No, I was thinking of the uh, Leon Janney. Oh, yeah, Leon Janney. Well, he was actually the commercial guy. Rheingold. He Beth? was a Rheingold distributor right. on the air. Right. Yeah, right. He, he was a fun guy to be around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He and he did a good job. Yeah, it was... Um, yeah, because his father, I think it was, was had been a well-known actor of what did you know? Something, something like that. I forget uh -huh. what it was. Uh -huh. That's been a long time. Yeah, ago. but he, he was a real character, though. He was a fun guy. Yeah, I remember. When we talk about opening day for the best now, you're talking about 40 years ago. Yeah, right? well, that's, yeah. So that's a long period of time. Seems like yesterday. Oh, well, at times it does. Yeah, yeah. or last week. Sometimes it, it seems like 40 years, and sometimes it seems like practically nothing. Right. <laughs> it's true. They, um... And over the years, you've also had, I think, some pretty good uh, directors. Oh, yeah, like terrific directors. We had Jack Simon for the, in those beginning days. Mm -hmm. and Jack was a terrific baseball yeah. director. Yeah. And, of course, Billy Webb came along later, and Billy Webb was so outstanding, right. and, and is still to this day yep. a top-notch baseball director. Yep. Yeah, they've been there's some real good talent here, and you had, uh, and I think... Uh, was the producer at WOR, Rick Miner. Oh, Rick Miner's terrific television yeah. guy. Yeah, Rick Miner was, terrific. A, was a good guy. Yeah, I, mean, I think he had a good team of people that really... Well, a guy like Rick would make sure he brought the talent together, you know, and kept the operation solid. Right, right. And But, you know, I mean, there's, there's an awful lot that goes into putting on a broadcast or putting on a telecast. And I think you need to have that professional team, oh, you do, absolutely. You know, behind you. Well, this is New York. If you can't be professional in New York, where are you going to be professional? Well, that's true, yeah. And New York won't stand for anything else. No, anything else. probably not. Probably not. Uh, of all the games that you've done and all the plays that you've seen, Bob, give me three, four, or five that stand out. Well, there's mind. one game that just stands out way ahead of all the other thousands of games. And it was the sixth game of the playoffs in 1986. The game was played in Houston, Texas. Mike Scott had already dominated the Mets in two games at that point. So the Mets had to win the game six because if they didn't, Mike Scott would be the pitcher in game seven. They're playing in Houston and they're behind three nothing going into the ninth inning. They were hitting against Bob Nepper who had a great day that day. But they managed to get three runs and tie the game up at the top of the ninth. Now we go on. Roger McDowell came in. McDowell was sensational. He pitched five scoreless innings. He allowed one infield hit. Mets finally get a run in the 14th inning. It looks like they're going to win it and go to the World Series. What happens? Billy Hatcher hits a home run that struck the foul pool and tied the game up. Now we go on to the 16th inning. And in the 16th inning, the Mets broke, broke out and scored three runs. But the game wasn't over. And back come the Houston Astros. They, the bullpen had been completely depleted. Jesse Orozco, who had already won two postseason games in that series, was out there strictly on fumes. He had no energy left at all. 
And finally, with the tying and winning runs on base, Jesse Orozco had to get this hitter out, Kevin Bass. And Bass had been the leading hitter of the Houston club that year. Left-hand hitter would be facing Jesse Orozco. That's when Keith Hernandez and Gary Carter came to the mound. And Hernandez said to Gary Carter, if you call for anything but a breaking ball, I'll fight you right here. Mm -hmm. Whether that happened or not, I don't know. But anyhow, Orozco struck out Bass. It was finally over. The Mets had won in 16 innings. They would go to the World Series. And that, of course, was the famous Boogie Wilson World Series. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it was, uh, I think, also, I mean, uh, you certainly were a, 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 a part of and a witness to the, the 69 season, which was oh, yeah, so startling course. because of where they had come from. Well, that's very true. I remember in spring training of 69, talking with Gil Hodges, who I just adored. I thought Gil Hodges might very well be as fine as any man I've ever known in all of sports. And I said to Gil, how many games can this team win this year, Gil? He said, let me think about it a minute. He said, maybe 75, which was a staggering figure for the best of those days. And then he said, you know, if I really believe that, if I really believe they can win 75, why can't I figure out a way to win another 10 and we'll go on to play in the postseason? They, they did exactly that. Mm -hmm. The message you'll recall in that year, they were well behind the Chicago Cubs. They weren't even in the running. They were eight and a half games back in August. They went blowing by the Cubs. The Cubs went as bad as the best were hot. And the Mets wound up by winning it by eight games. They wound up winning 100 games that year. Now they have to play the Orioles in the World Series. Baltimore is a dynasty team. I mean, a real dynasty team. It doesn't look like the Mets even belong in the same building with them. The Orioles win the first game, but the Mets win the next four mm -hmm. and win the World Series. Yeah, it was a, uh, a startling and very exciting uh, season. I mean, no question, because this is a team that we had been used to them being lovable losers. Oh, this team. But Tom Seaver brought the new spirit to the team along with the manager, Gil Hodges, more, probably more than anything else. Yeah. But those guys knew they could play, and they wanted to win, and knew they could win. I can remember being in San Francisco in July, going out to lunch with Don Cardwell. And Cardwell was sitting there, and while we are having lunch, he said, you know, Bob, we ought to win this thing. I said, do you mean that, Cardi? He said, yeah, we should win this thing. And they sure did. Yeah, I did, uh, never heard that story. I didn't know he said that. That was in, in July on the West Coast trip? Yeah. Wow, that's terrific. Then uh, we had another kind of odd thing where we thought that the Mets uh, should have won the World Series and leading three games to two in 1973. Well, that was another dynasty ball club. The Oakland A's of that period that you're talking about, Billy, just like the Baltimore Orioles, had been so successful, nobody thought they had a chance. And here are the Mets going back to Oakland, needing only a victory to win the World Series. But that was the Reggie Jackson ball club. It was a terrific ball club. Willie Mays was playing on his very last legs. He could hardly get under a fly ball anymore because he just his age had just taken him over. But uh, so the Mets lost it. But they at least they went to the seventh game of the World Series. Yep, they made a series of it, and uh, it was very exciting. Thing they did, they beat three dynasty teams. Cincinnati, the, the big red machine, was a dynasty ball club, and the Mets wiped them out. They beat Baltimore in the World Series, and they almost beat Oakland, a dynasty team. So they were really playing some ball clubs in those days. Yeah, yeah, and they, uh, and they were terrific, and the pitching was just great. I mean, they had a wonderful pitching staff. Oh, the pitching was marvelous, yeah. just marvelous. The interesting thing, too, is that so many of those pitchers lasted so long. They knew how to take care of themselves, mm -hmm. and they knew how to take care of their pitching mechanics. Not, not just Tom Seaver, but Tug McGraw and Jerry Kuzman and the other guys. They all pitched about 20 years, excuse mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. before the career was over. Yeah. Well, Nolan Ryan's a pretty good example. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, he's a young man here who uh, became an, uh, an old man and got better. It was, uh, he was incredible. I mean, he in really was. 69, the best going down to Atlanta for the playoffs. The best hitter in baseball that year was a guy named Rico Cardi. The big man, bad boy. He has a chance to tear the Mets up early in the game at about the fourth inning. Gill calls for Nolan Ryan. Nolan Ryan comes in for the bullpen. He'd always been a starting pitcher and struck out Rico Cardi. The late Paul Richards said after that game, that's the only man in, in the baseball world who could have struck out Rico Cardi was Nolan Ryan, and he did it. Yeah, and it turned that series around. Yeah, oh, sure. And the Mets went on to win the pennant. And uh, when that, you know, that, that, in fact, that was the first year, I think, of that uh, 
division uh, or LCS. It was what the first year of divisional play. Yeah, right. That's and, right. And, and that year, so many people were against the idea. They were so wrong. It has turned out to be one of the most wonderful things baseball has ever done by going to divisional play. Right now, as we speak and talk, it adds so much excitement to baseball, you can't believe it. Absolutely. And there are five or six teams that have a chance to make the playoffs uh, would normally be dead in the water at this point yeah. in time. And the fan interest is, stays up because of that. You know, and I think uh, it, it is, uh, you know, really very exciting. In the, uh, in the first years of the Mets, they didn't have a lot of talent. They had some interesting character. I'll tell Who, you what they did. Who's your favorite have. character? They could score runs. You know, that 1962 mm -hmm. team had a lot of hitting. Yeah, Frank Thomas. And they had a couple of starting pitchers, but they didn't have a single pitcher in the bullpen. So they couldn't hold a lead. It didn't matter if they were ahead by 7-1 to one in the seventh inning. They were still going to lose the ball game. But they really had some interesting characters. Yeah. Frank Thomas was in the outfield along with Richie Ashburn. Yeah. Of course, the late Gil Hodges was there. The whole outfit was just a terrific bunch of guys. The, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the catcher. Tutu Coleman. No, well, yeah, Chuchu Coleman was one of the catchers, there's no doubt about that. And Chuchu, Casey used to say of Chuchu, you got to have a guy like Chuchu because otherwise you'll be chasing the ball to the backstop all day because the other guys won't catch that ball to the breaking ball in the dirt. Right. Right. Yeah, Clarence Yeah, that was, a, that was a fun experience. Rod Keneal. Casey's always called him Rod Canoe. I know, I know. That's why I was laughing. I was always every time you talk. You, we had a had a guy named Chris Canazero, a catcher. Mm -hmm. He called him Canzanari. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I seem to think there the was a famous fighter. That's right, Tony Canzanari. Canzanari. You bet, yeah. absolutely, Tony Canzanari. Yeah. And uh, but that was the thing with Casey. The thing with Casey is you had to know what he was talking about in order to follow the conversation. <laughs> yeah, Casey was Casey was one of a kind, no doubt about <laughs> it. <laughs> Thank the Lord. Edna would be at the game almost every day. Casey and Edna, what a pair they were. They were terrific. Edna was wonderful. Yeah, and yeah. Casey was a real character and, and, and a clown by nature. I mean, he was a perfect guy. Oh, he was a clown, sure. Yeah. Perfect guy for a situation like we had at that time. But he also was a terrific, had a terrific baseball mind. Yeah. Richie Ashburn told me many times after that season was over in the later years when he was broadcasting for the Phillies, he said he never met a better baseball mind than Casey Stingle. Mm -hmm. That Casey really had this game figured out. Yeah. yeah, he was one of the few people who really had it broken down. He really understood the game. And uh, it, it, all the rest of it was a sideshow because he really knew his baseball, and that, that was critical. But listen, Bob, we'll let you go back to work. I do appreciate it. And, Bill, uh, my pleasure, my friend. I am Thanks delighted. for the invitation. I am delighted. Thanks for the Thank invitation you. to join you. Right.